Hey, welcome to the shop. So today we're talking weld distortion. You know, once you kind of get to start making projects, it doesn't take too long before one turns into a pretzel. I've had it happen to me a lot of times and uh, we'll talk about some of the principles behind it and some things you can do. So I've clamped this aluminum bar in my vise and I'm gonna go ahead and heat it up here just with a map gas torch and we can watch it expand. You can see on this indicator how it grows when I heat it up. But then when I pour some water on and cool it down, it shrinks back to the size that it, it originally was, right? So there's not really a permanent effect because this has been heated in a uniform way and uh, cooled back down and nothing is really pushed on it while it was hot. Now imagine if you were to heat just the top part of that bar and it were to expand and the rest wouldn't. Let's try that out. So here I've put the indicator on top and I'm going to move this torch around and as I heat the top up, the top will expand more than the bottom and that bends it. You can see how it bends around up and down just by moving my torch. That's pretty fun. But still, it moves back to the spot where we started. So how come when you weld, things distort and they stay uh, out of position? But if I put this plate in in place and set it up in the same way and run a weld all the way across, now the top is going to be you know liquid and things can move around and then once that solidifies or freezes there's some thermal contraction that happens there and then as it cools on the top it'll bend up towards the weld and i'll run another bead here you can see it bends up even more as i do that and so that's what happens with weld distortion and that's the direction that it'll go mainly is towards your weld now, not only will the weld distort in that direction, it'll also distort along the direction that you're welding. And this can be kind of an interesting phenomenon. So I'll just take these two little plates here and I'll space them out with an even gap and run a weld um, from one side that's tacked towards a free edge, just about a third of the way, about uh, two inches or 50 millimeters up the plate. And you can see there's still the gap, but let's watch as it cools. You can actually watch those plates pulling in toward one another. And so that closes it up. So things are distorting as it cools towards the direction of welding. Well, why does that happen? It's because it, uh, everything had solidified at the beginning and it was hot towards the end. So over there towards the end, there was more cooling to happen and more contraction and that actually bends it closed. But the counterintuitive thing about this is when you're welding along, if I were to weld along the whole length of this, if I had a really long plate, as I weld along, often I'll have it actually open up while I'm welding because things are expanding along and uh, that can be kind of a strange thing to encounter. So these are some of the fundamental concepts behind weld distortion and the things to think about and honestly you can just use a little bit of common sense in how to deal with it. Let's talk about a few common techniques that we can use to deal with this. The first one is just reduce the overall amount of weld you're putting on there, right? And this can happen by you know, let's say you're running a fillet weld, you don't want to oversize it beyond what you need. Obviously, you want to have enough there to be strong enough for the application, but a lot of small DIY projects, it can be pretty small. Watch as I run this 1 8 inch electrode, run them pretty slow, and then I'll move on to a 3 32ths of an inch electrode, run in a bit quicker. And you can see there's a significant difference in the size of the fillet welds there, and that's going to reduce the amount of distortion. Another way that you can reduce the amount of distortion that you have is by running an intermittent weld. So say for every uh, three inches or 75 millimeters of your joint, maybe you only need one inch or uh, 25 millimeters of weld, right? And so you can space them out like that. And that's strong enough for a lot of applications. It can help you move quicker and uh, reduce distortion there. Another way to reduce the amount of weld that you put in is just to take a little bit more care with your fit up, right? And so you can use a saw, get everything dialed in and uh, when everything fits together then you're not filling a gap because when you're filling a gap you have just a ton of material that'll pull and warp and I'll admit I've filled some gaps before and uh, to be honest I've seen the distortion that's come from that firsthand so definitely a good idea to take a little care for your fit up now another thing that you can do that makes a really big difference is you can tack your material up right and so you get some good solid tacks that restrain things from moving around look at these two plates that I have just sitting free here on the bench. I have one clamp down, the other one is free to move around. No tacks at all as I weld along. You can see it rise up quite a bit higher 
than it was before. Visible distortion happening there where if I put two good tacks, one on either end and weld along here, you can see it's just not free to move as easily. We did get some distortion, but not nearly as much. So let's put them up side by side here and you can see how the one that uh, wasn't tacked distorted quite a bit more. And I was honestly surprised at this result that it came out uh, this much different and so I, I repeated the test and got basically the same result once again. Now let's talk for a second about a butt joint like this. So since it's welded on the one side it did pull up a little bit. If you wanted to counter that you could just put a weld on the opposite side and that would pull it back. So say you were running like a two or a three pass weld on both sides of a joint you'd probably want to do one pass on one side one on the other and then alternate back and forth so you're pulling things and uh, you know keeping it even rather than pulling everything to one side because it's not going to pull back at some point. Now let's talk about clamping and fixturing. Now there are different kinds of welding squares. This is a magnetic square and they're, they're pretty common um, around. This is really the only kind that I use. It's a switchable square here. Um, that's really quite strong. It can go in corners like this or it can be used at angles and those are really handy but uh, the one thing that they don't do is keep everything in place. So if you're using one of these you definitely need to tack everything together. But let's talk about these type of squares here. These ones are cast welding squares made by Fireball Tool. I'm not sponsored by uh, either of these companies but uh, I, I do think they make a good product. These cast Fireball squares are really handy. You can put them in place and uh, they come in a bunch of different shapes and clamp your material right to them to hold everything square while you get it tacked up and fabricated. Another kind are these from Genuine Metalworks and I actually like these really well because not only can you tack with them, they have enough clearance here you can weld things out. So we're going to use these Genuine squares today though I, I do like all of them for fabrication. You can clamp things in place hold everything true and square. So I've cut a 45 degree miter joint here and I'm going to go ahead and clamp it to this square. Now as I uh, do that, that's going to strain things from moving quite a bit. Now when I weld this joint out, first I'll put four good solid tacks on it. Now this is the order that I will weld um, a miter joint in and the sequence in which you weld can make a difference with your weld distortion. First I'll weld the outside corner because that is going to pull least of all. Then after that's done, I'll weld the sides from the inside to the outside in hopes of opening things up just slightly and then it'll be locked pretty well in place before I put in the fillet weld which will pull more than anything. And I found that to work pretty well. So I'm, I went ahead and welded this one out while it was clamped in the square so it was restrained and we can check it. And you see it's pretty close to 90 degrees there. One last thing that I'll mention is that different materials will distort more than others. You know, particularly stainless steel um, will warp all over the place. I've made a real mess of some stuff trying to weld stainless steel and having it distort because of its coefficient of thermal expansion, like how much it uh, stretches and shrinks for each degree that it increases in temperature. And also because it doesn't conduct heat very well, you can get really localized areas that are at an elevated temperature. And so it uh, can make a real mess. So again, there's so much that we could talk about when it comes to weld distortion and a lot of it, uh, you know, to figure out and it's different in every application. But if you just keep some of these fundamental basic principles in mind, I think it'll really help you out to have projects that you're going to be happy with at the end of the day. Well, thanks for tuning in today. If you learned something here, enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting that thumbs up down there. And also, if you'd uh, like to learn about a certain welding topic, let me know in the comments below and I'll see if I can't make a video about that. We'll see you next time.